In lecture 28 today, we're going to focus completely on Taylor series. So in lecture A, we'll focus on formulas to know and methods of calculations, many of which we've done already, but I'll make sure we review what you should know. In lecture B, we'll get into applications to math. So that would be applications to graphing, to calculating limits, and to approximating quantities and introduce the idea of the error in using a Taylor polynomial approximation. Hopefully on Friday and next Monday we can get into some physics applications, maybe some finance applications, maybe even some probability applications as well, though I'll try to keep them relatively basic of Taylor series. We do have a test, our second main exam, Friday of next week, nine days from now. Um, I will work on posting some old exam problems. Um, that I've given in the past, though there could be some other problems that could be on your test that won't, won't show up on that list, but I'll try to think about letting you know what kinds of other kinds of problems to expect um, as other possibilities. The exam will cover chapters 9 and 10 completely, but also part of chapter 8. At the last exam, I believe we got through section 8.5. For the density and center of mass, as well as some probability. So new things since that exam included things like work done by a force, lifting chains, um, or water pressure and force, that kind of thing were, were the first applications that we did after that last exam. And then present and future value and that type of stuff, actuarial applications. Yeah, actually this is the first time I've taught actuarial applications in this class, so I wouldn't have old exam problems for, for those types, but I will have to think about what kinds of exam problems I would give you for that, and I will probably come up with a typical example to show you, and then you can study that. Since they were so long, those problems were so long, I have to pick and choose something so that it's, it's doable, probably that I'd give you some help with. All right, Taylor series. So, what kinds of facts should you know? Well, first of all, there are series formulas worth memorizing again, even though you can use a note card. Maybe you, maybe you don't want to put these formulas on your note card. Maybe you want to try to memorize these. One fundamental one is the Taylor series for 1 over 1 minus x because that is a simple form of this expression, which is the sum of a geometric series with first term a and common ratio r, where r is strictly between negative 1 and 1. a is 1, x is r, or I should say r is x. This is going to equal 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth, etc. The interval of convergence is the set of all values of x whose absolute value is strictly less than 1. You should be comfortable realizing that that means that x is strictly between negative 1 and positive 1, so you can also write this interval like that. Based on this, you can find Taylor series for other functions by, just by substitution. I think we did 1 over 1 plus x squared last time. You could do 1 over 1 plus x cubed. Or actually for a little bit of variety, let's do 1 over, one over um, 8 plus x cubed. Through a little bit of algebraic trickery and use of this formula, you can figure out the Taylor series for this. The algebraic trickery involves trying to get a 1 right there, first of all. So there's an 8 there now, so factor it out like this. That's the same as having a 1 8 in the numerator. Now we have a 1 right there. I'd also like to get a minus right there. Well, use a little bit of algebraic trickery for that. Put a minus sign here, and then put a negative sign in front of this, x cubed over 8, which you might also want to write as x over 2 quantity cubed. 
Either way is okay. You could write it like this. It would be okay to also write this as negative x cubed over 8. Either way is okay. You have it now in the right form, a over 1 minus r, or like this, with a, not, with a number other than 1 up there, but you would take this series essentially and replace all the x's with negative x cubed over 8, and have a 1 8 in front, and you can multiply the 1 8 throughout the end. So, if you continue with this, you can just put the 1 8 in front, Look over there, 1 plus x means 1 plus this. Replace the, all the x's with this expression. 1 plus negative x cubed over 8, which really means you're going to subtract x cubed over 8. Go to the next term, replace x there with negative x cubed over 8. You've got to square that, etc. Now just simplify. Multiply the 1 8 through. And square this, for example. x cubed squared will be x to the sixth. 8 squared is 64 times another 8. What's 8 cubed? Uh, 512, I think. I think that's right. look like that. What's the interval of convergence? Remember, this thing was playing the role of x. It's going to converge when that thing is less than 1 in absolute value. Because of the absolute value <coughs> signs, we can get rid of the negative sign. 8 is also positive. This is equivalent to saying, ultimately, that the absolute value of x cubed over 8 must be less than 1, which means the absolute value of x cubed must be less than 8, which means the absolute value of x must be less than 2. The interval of convergence <laughs> is from negative 2 to 2. 2 because that's the cube root of 8. That would be the interval of convergence for this. So by substitution and algebraic trickery, you can often find the series for other functions that are similar. This formula is actually a special case of this formula, a formula for expanding a binomial. It's a special case when p is negative 1 and x is replaced by negative x. In this one, we give you that one. If p is a not negative integer, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., the binomial theorem tells you how to expand this as a finite group of terms. For example, 1 plus x quantity squared. Well, let's do cubed. 1 plus x quantity cubed. By the binomial theorem in Pascal's triangle, turns out to expand to this, and that's a finite series. It's, a, it's not really in a series if that's typical. It converges for all x. So what I'm about to write down is really only new in the case where p is not a non-negative integer. It's not 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. It could be a fraction. It could be a negative number. The formula is that this equals 1 plus p, time, p times x. <coughs> Excuse me. Plus p times p minus 1 over 2 factorial times x squared. Plus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 over 3 factorial times x cubed. Plus p times p minus 1 times p minus 2 times p minus 3 over 4 factorial times x to the fourth, etc. Goes on forever when p is not a non negative integer. And it converges for such values of p when the absolute value of x is less than 1. So, as an example, we can take the square root of 1 plus x and treat it as 1 plus x to the 1 half, and then use this formula with p equal to 1 half. 
giving you 1 plus 1 half x plus 1 half times negative 1 half over 2 factorial times x squared. P is 1 half here. P minus 1 would be negative 1 half. Plus P, 1 half, times P minus 1, negative 1 half, times P minus 2, negative 3 halves, over 3 factorial times x cubed, etc. Simplify. You already get a negative sign there. Negative 1 fourth and then divide that by 2 factorial means divide by 2 as well. You get minus 1 eighth x squared. And then with this one, two negative signs you're going to cancel to give you a positive quantity. The 3 there can be thought of as canceling with the 3 from the 3 factorial there. Really, we're going to have, it looks like, four twos that we divide by 2 to the 4th, which is 16. That's the way it looks to me here. It looks like it's going to be plus 1 16 x cubed. I did show you how to check this last time. Actually, I might have done this in the second section, which is where I ultimately videotaped what I put on um, Moodle. Did I show you guys series last time, or was that, <coughs> that might have been just the second class? Series is a built-in Mathematica function that can calculate Taylor series. Let me just go ahead and check this. What's the series for square root of 1 plus x in terms of x where you center it at 0, in other words the a is 0 in the Taylor series formula. And how many non-zero terms do I want? Well, for example, I could put 5 of them here. That's the syntax that will find the Taylor series for this expression. In terms of x, centered at 0, five, the first 5 non-zero, or maybe it's, that's the degree of the highest power that we we'll see here. Yeah, that's simplified at least. This thing here is called big O of x, with the 6 there. And basically, that just means there are higher order terms, 6 degree and higher, that it's not showing you. The 5 here says, show me in detail the first, um, well, 6 terms in this case, up to the 5th degree of x. And on the board, you see we got up to there, and then we do it to match. That coefficient was 160. Okay, so that's the quick way to get the series expansion in Mathematica. And it's checking that what we did there, right there. These formulas, by the way, can be derived with the general Taylor series formula involving taking the derivatives of the functions and plugging in A and dividing by appropriate factorials. I wrote that last time. I think I also wrote it last Friday on the board. You know what formula I'm talking about? Let me write the summation for a little bit. This formula. You can use the, this formula to derive these two expansions. That's the kth derivative of f. That's what that notation means. Plug in a. a is 0 in these examples. Divide by k factorial. x minus a is x minus 0. So you just get x to the k there. That doesn't prove that they equal the functions, but it turns out they are equal for values of x in the interval of convergence. For this one here, since it's a, a special case of this one, it's true when the absolute value of x is less than 1. Something I'm a little bit confused about with the summation formula. Yep. So the kth derivative, oh, never mind, that's the derivative of a, not times a. Yeah, the derivative of f evaluated at a. Okay, yeah. I was confused. Plug in a into the derivative. Yeah, in that case. Again, typically a is 0. Actually, this is a little funny. When a is 0, Taylor series aren't always called Taylor series. They're sometimes called the Maclaurin series. Okay, so if you've ever heard of Maclaurin series, the Maclaurin series are Taylor series when a is 0. But we usually just focus on calling the Taylor series because it keeps it simpler. A is 0 is the most common thing to use, though sometimes you use other values of A. 
What else is worth remembering? How about those series for sine, cosine, and E? Centered at A equals zero. Sine of x is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus x to the seventh over 7 factorial. And the pattern continues. Question? Uh, for these, yes, you can just write them down. Yep. Again, this formula could be used to derive that. It's not too hard to use it in this example with the sine function. The derivatives of sine are always going to be sine of x, cosine of x, negative sine of x, or negative cosine of x. And when you plug zero into those things, you either get plus or minus one or zero, depending on which function you're looking at. So, Actually, it's pretty easy to derive these as Taylor expansions. Again, that doesn't prove that they equal the function. This is the Taylor expansion for the sine function about a equals zero. And it does converge for all x. The radius of convergence is infinity. The interval of convergence is the entire real number line. That's still not enough to prove the equal equality there, that sine of x actually equals that. To prove the equality there, which we will do, actually, you need some more information. You need information about error in Taylor polynomial approximations. And essentially, you need to show that error goes to zero no matter what x is, as we keep adding more and more terms to show the equality. Mm -hmm. How do you know that the uh, Taylor series converges for all x? You can use the ratio test for that. If you write it in a summation form, um, it's a little tricky. Let's see. You could start at 1. Um, to get the summation to work out right, if you're starting k at 1, you want to divide by an odd factorial. Um, and when k is 1, you really want to divide by 1 factorial. So the trick is to do 2k minus 1 factorial right there. If you start at k equals 1, because then when k is 1, 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 is a 1. When k is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3. When k is 3, 2 times 3 minus 1 is 5. So it's a little trick to make sure you're dividing by the right factorial. As far as the power of negative 1, you want the first one to be to be positive 1 and the second one to be negative 1. Uh, using a k plus 1 here would be good enough to, do, to make that happen. Because then when k is 1, this would be 2. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. When k is 2, this would be 3. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. That'll make the signs all oscillate. And then the power of x is the same as what you were taking the factorial of, so you can use 2k minus 1. When you write it in that form and you try to use the ratio test, Treat this as your, um, your a sub k for the ratio test. Factorials will cancel in such a way as to make the limit in the ratio test always less than 1, no matter what x is. In fact, I think it's 0, no matter what x is. And that will imply the series converges no matter what x is. The radius of convergence is infinity, and the interval of convergence is the entire room of not taking the time to check that, but I'm telling you, you should believe me, it really does work out that way. The cosine function is a similar expansion except with all even powers and even factorials. Starting with 1, which you can think of as x to the 0 over 0 factorial, ignoring the fact that 0 to the 0 power is undefined, not worrying about that fact. Minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, etc. 